Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. As we head into the 1996 presidential election, some issues already seem to have been settled, at least rhetorically. It's not whether to balance the budget, it's how soon. It's not whether the government should be shrunk, it's how much it should be shrunk. It's not whether welfare should be reformed, it's how. Now, these are conservative ideas in the saddle. Is liberalism in retreat? Joining us to sort through the conflict and consensus are E.J. Dion, author of They Only Look Dead, Why Progressives Will Dominate the Next Political Era, Ronald Walters, chairman of the political science department at Howard University and author of Black Presidential Politics in America, Todd Gitlin, professor of sociology at New York University and author of The Twilight of Common Dreams, and Will Marshall, president of the Progressive Policy Institute. A few weeks ago on this program, we looked at the future of conservatism. The question before this house, does liberalism have a future? This week on Think Tank. This is not the first time that liberalism has been declared dead. Listen to this, quotes, liberals meet in Washington these days if they can endure to meet at all to discuss the tragic outlook for all liberal proposals, the collapse of all liberal leadership, and the inevitable defeat of all liberal aims, end quotes. Does that sound like 1995 or 1996? Archibald MacLeish wrote those words in 1944. Well, so where is liberalism today? Since World War II, a central idea of liberalism was to strengthen the role of the federal government. But here's what President Bill Clinton, a Democrat and often described as a liberal, has to say about that. The era of big government is over. Affirmative action, another hallmark of recent liberalism, is unpopular and under attack. In California, a statewide referendum seeks to ban it entirely. And critics like our panelist Todd Gitlin argue that some liberals are so hung up over issues of race, ethnicity, and sex, the so-called identity politics, that the broader liberal coalition has been fractured. And finally, economics. Liberalism promised that government intervention would result in growth and job security, but in an era of global competition, high technology and downsizing, economic problems seem immune to liberal remedies. Union membership, for example, is sinking. Economic insecurity is rising. The government seems paralyzed. Well, that's a nice picture. Uh, let us uh, go around the room once, uh, starting with, uh, with you, E.J. Dion. Uh, is liberalism dead or does it only look dead, which is almost the title of your book. I think liberalism is coming back to life almost precisely for the reasons you said, that when people are going through a period of economic insecurity and uncertainty, they look for some new rules and they look for some help to seize the opportunities of a new era. In the past, that's when they've turned to liberal and progressive politicians, and I think they're going to do so again. Okay. Uh, Will Marshall, alive, dead, moribund. Well, a certain kind of liberalism, New Deal liberalism, interest group liberalism, I think is moribund, or at least we should regard it as being in an honorable retirement. The question is, is how does liberalism adapt itself to a whole new set of national challenges? And the good news for liberalism is that the alternative today, uh, anti-liberalism, uh, doesn't address those challenges either. Ron Walters, li alive, dead? Well, I think that it can't die. I think also it depends on how you actually define it. Uh, you can't have a liberalism which is dead with respect to interest group politics because uh, this country is uh, multiculturalizing, uh, so is the globe. And so you really do have to have a philosophy which looks uh, for the expansion, not only of government, uh, but for the expansion of opportunity. Okay. Uh, Todd Gitlin. I think liberalism has hopes. Um, and what is going to make the difference uh, in terms of whether it converts its hopes into actuality is whether it convinces enough people that if they don't uh, get serious about finding some common dream, that they will just uh, uh, lapse into the arms of big business 
and all of the reasons why big government came into existence in the first place. Uh, your common dreams, as I understood what Ron Walter said, are not Ron Walter's common dreams. We have to have a discussion about what common dreams are. I mean, I think there'll be a debate. Republicans will say the common dream is that everybody gets to be an entrepreneur. I think that's ridiculous, but that is an idea about what people have in common. My idea, uh, and many other people's idea, is that what people have in common is that they have certain uh, obligations to the maintenance of a society that's whole, and certain needs, which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but also a right to a decent livelihood, a right to security of person, a right to uh, public institutions like schools and public transportation that people need to live in. I don't, I don't know if we disagree on that, but I think a lot of people do agree. No, but I and think uh, and Ron, what's Ron, happened in the Ron recent Ron years... beyond that, is that correct? I would, I would certainly go beyond that. I think he's right in, in the terms of the dream, uh, but I think the difference is between the dream and the reality. When you look at the reality, uh, we share the dream, but the reality is that some people are much closer to the dream than others, and therein lies the problem. Uh, are you going to have a definition of liberalism uh, which only gives us sort of an intellectual vision of that dream, or are you going to have a definition of liberalism which is functional? And if you do, you've got to run up against the ability of government to provide expanding opportunity. Yeah, but, but, but you are saying on a race-specific or gender-specific or ethnically-specific grounds, uh, is as a way to measure? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, otherwise, you really don't have a measuring rod. Uh, you can't define it, I think, only by economic opportunity. You've got to look at these groups that are coming into society, uh, immigrants included, and, and say to yourself, uh, if uh, the demographics are right, uh, by the year 2050, uh, only 52 percent of this country is going to be white. Uh, so there is a tremendous continuing discussion about the nature of America, about the changes that are going to go on, and therefore the basis of liberalism. Excuse me, but those, those demographics aren't right. Um, there's no way to predict how people are going to feel about who they are two or three generations hence. Um, what will it mean to be white? What will it mean to be Hispanic? There's a tremendous amount of intermarriage already. The confidence with which these claims are made by the Census Bureau, I think, is scientifically invalid. What, what I'd like to say is if you go back to I liberalism, think you're right. If you go back to the sort of what the liberal idea has been on these subjects, you, the issue is not are we going to be an all quota society or a colorblind society where we pretend there's no such thing as racism. Liberals have always asserted that uh, cultural pluralism is a good thing, recognizing uh, the enormous contributions of all the groups to this country, that that's a good thing, that racism is a particular problem that we continue to have. That's very different from saying that we want to racialize every question, that every issue, whether it's public schools or public transportation or how you're going to get a job, that these are all racial questions. Most African Americans don't think that way, most white people don't think that way, most Hispanics don't think that way. And I think liberals have always asserted that we respect the fact that we've got to do something about racism, which is a particular problem. We also respect the fact that we are one country who, that has always had a common dream, as Todd has said. I agree that that's a traditional view of liberalism and one we desperately need to get back to, but it's not the current view. Liberalism today is bound up with the notion of biology as destiny and the po politicization of all issues around this, uh, uh, this uh, corralling of people into racial, ethnic, and gender uh, categories. And I think that's a, a tremendous liability to contemporary liberalism because what it does is it, uh, it, 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 it prevents us from having the kind of civic empathy that we need to have, prevents us from looking beyond our group identity towards some broader community. And I think before we get back to that, it's going to be impossible for Democrats and liberals to reconnect to the economic uh, anxieties and aspirations of the middle class. And that, that after all, is the big political challenge. But you know, I think that will only happen when you really do address the issues of groups. Uh, you can't leap over uh, groups because groups were the basis of a, a certain sense of subordination in this country. Um, slavery was based upon uh, groups. Uh, at the time of the manumission of slaves in 1865, 90% um, of all blacks were in slavery. Uh, that was a group basis of that subordination. Uh, and so if you look even down as far as 1960 and ask uh, what, how many blacks made the average family income, it's only 5%. 95% is a basis of subordination of blacks didn't make even the average family income. So uh, you can't then leap over 30 years later to, to start talking about individuals unless you deal with that basis of group subordination. 
which is part of the legacy of this country. Let me just go back to, to what we said in the setup piece and just see if we are in agreement on that, that, that the current consensus in the country is uh, that we do want a balanced budget, that we do want to reduce the size of government, that we do want serious welfare reform, and that in fact those ideas and many others that we could all list are in fact uh, have their roots in the conservative ideology and that seems to be the way the country is going. Yes, Americans in principle think we shouldn't run a big deficit, but we just had a controlled experiment in 1995 and the Republicans said, okay, we want to cut back the growth in Medicare, Medicaid, uh, education spending, we want to cut back on environmental regulations, and the electorate quite clearly said, wait a minute, that's not what we think we voted for uh, in 1994. So the public, sure, the public wants fiscal sanity, but it also believes that a lot of these things, including things you helped fight for when you worked for LBJ, have been successful programs that they want to save. The thing about it is Americans want everything at once. They want all these things. They want apple pie, but they also want, they want pie a la mode. They also want <laughs> <laughs> they also want uh, uh, health care. They also want a raising of the minimum wage. They also want a lot of things I that think they think they're entitled to get. It's really important that we don't uh, uh, let this notion that any attack on bureaucratic liberal programs is uh, a, a conservative one. Take welfare, for example. Uh, fundamental welfare reform is something that 80 to 90 percent of the people of this country are for. It cuts across all racial and class lines. Uh, and it, it doesn't, you don't have to be conservative to want to reform the welfare system. Daniel Patrick Moynihan and other notable liberals have been trying to do it for decades. Yeah, but the notable liberals who ran the Congress in 1993 and 1994 were, were not anxious to reform welfare. I am well, not, you, you uh, know that not, better yeah, than anyone. I, I, they didn't I pass sure healthcare reform either. No, they but, failed. I am not yeah, saying that there are not, I'm friends. not saying that liberals are not defending failed bureaucratic programs. They are, and that's one of their principles, uh, another mm -hmm. liability. Right. My point is, is that the alternative all too often is simply a kind of a mirror image agenda on the right that says let's let's tear down the liberal achievement the edifice that they've built over the last 60 years but they don't have any idea about what they're going to replace it with and that's where they keep failing it's a complete it's a dismantling agenda not an agenda that replaces programs that aren't working with approaches that uh, hold out more promise let me ask a, a tactical question as as we have this discussion in in mid-april for all the moaning about how poorly liberalism is doing Bill Clinton is beating Bob Dole in the polls by about 12 to 15 points. Is Clinton riding high because there is a resurgence of liberalism or because he has at least cosmetically made a U-turn? How about neither? I mean, I think in, this, in one sense, Bill Clinton defined himself first with a, he had a fight with the Republican Congress and he said, look, I stand for this, 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 and this. I disagree with them on that. Wherever you stood on the issues, I think that helped give him a presence in the country was something people respected. He could define himself against the Republicans. I think secondly, a lot of these things he's talking about, for example, throwing criminals out of, of housing projects, talking about the family, he's done that since 1992. You don't feel that in 1993 and 1994 when you had a Democratic President Clinton and an all-Democratic Congress that, that, that he went uh, substantially to the left of what he ran on? See, I don't think Because voters, he believes that. If you look at, at Clinton's first two years, I think a lot of voters did not say he went too far to the left or too far to the right. They say, gee, the Democrats failed. They said they'd give us health care reform and it failed. They said they'd give us welfare reform and it failed. They said they'd give us political reform and it failed. They said they'd help give us job training and education and that kind of got shrunk in the budget. So uh, I think a lot of voters pull back not because of the ideological stuff, but because they sense, gee, we expected more from these but guys. I think these, these were, let me just say, this was the season of 1994, too. And I right, think that accounts right. for the election in 1994. But and seizing a conservative mandate as a reaction to that, what happened is I think that Newt Gingrich politics hit a wall. And I think that's what the American people are responding to. What the polling shows now, interestingly, is that uh, Republicans are down. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, something in their rush at uh, uh, the budget and, and this array of programs, many of which are still popular, scared a lot of folks, and they are down. But Democrats have not gone up correspondingly. I mean, that's, 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 that's the era we're in now. We're in a three, uh, you know, it's a three-way split now. There's a huge group of unaffiliated, non-aligned voters who hold the balance of American politics. That's why I would be uh, most unconfident if I were a Democratic strategist now about this uh, temporary uptick in uh, Bill Clinton's popularity ratings. But, but let me go back to the point E.J. made. I mean, E.J.'s right about the failure of Clinton and the Democratic Congress to 
deliver, but the problem is much more fundamental than that. The Democratic Party and contemporary liberalism is defending a regime that's dying. It's defending an old, top-down, bureaucratic way of solving problems that people simply lack confidence in. It's the same problem, I think, of uh, parties of the Democratic left in Europe, uh, which is why many of them have been out of power for a long time. We've got to think well, through what well, governance well, means well, in a new well, era well, and find new ways of solving problems. Well, That's what the public's well, looking well, for. Well, That's well, the kind of formula that I think Parts of the government work well. You know, you call Social Security for advice, you're going to get it much faster than if you call a lot of private corporations. People mm -hmm. want the government to be active. They want the government to get results. They're pragmatic about where the results come from. I think that what liberalism has to make sure it doesn't do is to sacrifice its soul. And its soul has rested on a matter that we haven't really talked about yet, which is a real conviction about equality. Equality of persons, equality in access to opportunity, equality in an absolute uh, rejection of discrimination. And I think it's extremely important, whether Bill Clinton wins or not, that that side of the liberal vision not be uh, sacrificed. That's very true, well, and I well, agree well, entirely, but I just want to make yeah, a distinction ahead. between ends and means. You're exactly right about equality. That's the soul. That's, we have to maintain that commitment. But it doesn't follow that there's one uh, monochromatic way of going about it. Right, that. but let's say we want to make sure that it's absolutely intolerable to discriminate in employment or housing or lending. How are you going to do that without calling a government agency in to enforce the law. Of course, uh, no one's uh, saying we're repealing anti-discrimination laws. That's no, not we have I'm laws, but they're not enforced. But, but they, should be, they should be enforced. I agree with stepped-up enforcement. But my point is uh, there are lots of things that we're trying to do in government, some of them uh, under the rubric of equality. Uh, let's take our social welfare policies, which we know now, uh, the evidence is overwhelming, that they've been failing. They've become dysfunctional. They've begun to no. underwrite no. No. problems Sorry. in inner city communities, no. and yet we've been unable to come to grips with those problems and reimagine the way we try to lift people out of poverty. See, well, let, let, let me just interrupt here for a minute. You know, there's an old saying, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus. Okay, but she doesn't have wheels. You guys, particularly you, Will, but uh, many of you, certainly you, EJ, uh, just now, are saying, oh, if liberalism would just change this and would just change that and just recognize that you really have to do welfare reform and you have to do this and you have to do that, then they would be back. But that's not what liberals have been doing for 30 years. They've been gone bananas by my life. Years. We're yeah, talking yeah. about, I they think, a real liberal. reform in the way... Look at Todd's book, for example. Take Todd's book, The Twilight of Common Dreams. Todd wrote a very good critique of a certain style of multiculturalism, and it was a critique from the left, because he said, the problem with this is not just the things that conservatives say about it. The problem with this is that, in fact, it takes our eye off the ball of a genuinely fair and equal society. That's, uh, Todd's book is an example of this. I think some of Will's ideas have been accepted by large numbers of liberals about the need to, I mean, for example, all the stuff Will has written about civic life and the importance of strengthening our civic sense in third sectors in society. Some of those ideas started on the right. They didn't all come from the right. Actually, some of them came from the new left. But this notion yeah, that but you, you need know, a strong civic life, know, that's popular. But you know, you've got an intellectualism of both <laughs> the left and the right here, which I think is wrong because so much of this really is spending without the people who are really affected. Uh, when you come to assess things like poverty, uh, yes, you're right, uh, Will, a lot of people want changes in the welfare system, but the fact is you cannot say that it didn't do what it was designed to do. The fact that people want to change it now is quite another discussion altogether. They want to turn it into a jobs program. Now, we had a jobs program and Reagan killed it, all right? So that now they want to turn the welfare program into a jobs program. That's fine. But we really have to be honest about the ideological currents which come through and change things. We can't say that everything failed because these things haven't. You have yeah. to talk to the people who came through welfare and who made an honest living uh, today out of a welfare system that worked for what it was designed to do. If uh, Senator Dole wins the election in November of 1996, you will have for the first time in at least 70 years a Republican uh, conservative, mainstream conservative president, a Republican conservative Senate, House, sympathetic Supreme Court, uh, control of the governorships, and probable control of the state legislatures and state legislators, as well as the, uh, the, mayor, the, mayor, uh, the mayors of Los Angeles uh, and New York. This is unheard of in contemporary American politics, unheard of. Uh, if that happens, and that's just on the election of Dole, uh, is liberalism 
really in the ditch for a long time to come? Because won't the other guys really get their shot? Well, first of all, that's like if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus. I mean, you <laughs> no, were no, positive. That's one election. That, 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 that's who's going to win the election. Let me, let me if one just, of her wheels falls <laughs> off, she'll be in a ditch. No, but, uh, just two things. What it, that scenario you just described is actually Clinton's ace in the hole, because what all the polls show is the country really is uncomfortable with the prospect of this kind of unified conservative government because they think they'll go too far. To go back to your history, you work for LBJ. A lot of the stuff you guys did worked for the country. Medicare worked, food stamps worked, the civil rights worked, voting rights worked. This is a good legacy. There's nothing to be ashamed of I in this legacy. That. Don't you think that many of those, those programs were carried by liberals over the edge too far? But, well, how too far? I mean, is, I is Medicare yeah. gone too far? Is it they, too expensive? Yeah, sure, all the whole health right. system is. Yeah. Has it gone yeah. too far? I don't well, think so. The, these, well. thing, these programs were popular at a time when the country felt rich, the country was unrivaled, and Americans felt, well, let's do more of the same. There's no bad price for it. Today, people feel you can't have everything at once. But this doesn't mean that these were not great achievements. It also means that they have to be reformed. But nobody's willing to get rid of them. That's what I mean by changing the intellectual mood. And I think we have to look at the forces that were responsible for that. I mean, you had in two or three decades, you had uh, a downturn in the economy. Uh, you've had people now who are very afraid. And I think that when, when people get afraid, they start changing their evaluation. It's not that the programs change, it's that the evaluation has changed. What, what would you, if you, had to, if you had a paragraph to tell liberals how to govern and recapture uh, the mainstream of American thought and action, what would you tell them to do? I think the main concerns for Americans right now are both economic and moral. The economic is a sense of economic insecurity and worry, as President Clinton said, that people who work hard and play by the rules aren't going to be rewarded. That in turn is a moral question. Now I think liberals have to be unabashed about saying that economics and morality are linked and that if we want uh, liberalism to revive. It's going to have to do what it did for about a hundred years in our country, which is tell people it is possible to cre use government not to make people dependent, but to enhance people's opportunities to let them seize the chances in this new era and to create a sense, of, uh, a sense that the rules are fair that they're competing under. Okay, Todd? I would say liberalism has to support the, the fiber of the country. It has to be committed to those institutions which increase the access of all people to their common human heritage. And that includes reinvented government, government that works, and it also includes unions, and it includes public schools, and it includes metropolitan government, and all of those forces that enable Americans to live in a world with each other. Ron Walters? You've got to show people a vision of the future. Uh, you've got to show them that uh, this country is becoming uh, more <laughs> diverse. I don't think you can roll that back. Uh, I don't think we need to be frightened of it. I think that uh, we need to have a rational vision of what this country is going to be like. And I think that we have to locate somewhere the source of our economic fears. I think because uh, you can say that the white males are leading a conservative revolution, but the, at the end of the day, someone has to explain to them in non-racial terms, non-immigrant terms, what is happening to them. And I think that once we get uh, some of these uh, explanations right, I think then liberalism can show the path to leadership, and government has to play a role. Will Marshall, you're about in cleanup. I think liberalism has to adapt. It's got to identify itself once again as the party of innovation and new thinking. For about the last 20 years, we've been in rear guard positions, defending the old achievements, unwilling to admit criticism of them, and unwilling to offer something better, until we get into the arena and fight uh, you know, the battle of persuasion of the American people that we have better ideas that are updated uh, to new circumstances, we're not going to be competitive electorally. If it had wheels, it would be a bus. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much, uh, E.J. Dion, Will Marshall, Todd Gitlin, and Ron Walters. And thank you. And now we would like to announce part two of our bumper sticker contest. In part one, we asked viewers to make up bumper sticker slogans for or against President Clinton. For example, the anti-Clinton winning entry was Clinton, 99% fact free. A pro-Clinton entry was Clinton sacks, beats, stole drums. This time we are looking for bumper stickers for or against the Republican nominee, Bob Dole. So please send your entries, plus any other comments or questions, to New River Media, 1150 17th Street, 
Northwest Washington, D.C. 20036. We can also be reached by email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.